Donald Trump's in the middle of rolling out the launch of his re-election campaign, and it's more than that big Florida rally. There's been interviews on Fox, ABC, now Telemundo, an online push that hauled in a record-breaking 25 million, and courting the print media that Trump often attacks, like sitting for this new cover of Time magazine, where Trump proclaims his whole life is a bet, laying out a case for a second term, pointing to the economy, his base, and his political instincts. While a huge field of Democrats are running against Trump, pointing to his record-breaking lies in office, his stumbles on national security, and his policies on immigration and civil rights. Now, how is this whole race shaping up? We like to go to primary sources on this show, and now we turn to a top aide on Donald Trump's 2020 campaign, Strategic Communications Director Mark Lauder, a veteran of the Trump White House and the 2016 campaign. Thanks for coming on the beat. Thank you for having me. Is Donald Trump's core 2020 pitch any different uh, from 2016? Uh, I think absolutely. If you remember, anytime you're running for uh, on the outside to for an office, you're asking voters to put their faith in you that you're going to execute on the things that you said you were going to do. In this case, 2020 is going to be built much on promises made, promises kept, because the president has kept his promise to the American people to raise wages, bring manufacturing back, renegotiate bad trade deals, and also deal with the immigration crisis on our southern border. Yes, yeah, so you mentioned a lot of economics there. I'm curious what you think about a, a Fox News poll here where they asked uh, basically white voters without a college education what they think of Trump's economic policies and take a look basically only five percent say they help people like me uh, do you know why those folks don't trust Trump on economics and is that something you're trying to change well, I think oftentimes the, the economic data takes a while for the people uh, across the country to actually feel the difference in their pocketbooks and in their confidence. But we have seen just from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, we have record low unemployment for people without college degrees. These research shows that uh, paychecks are going up faster for people at the lower end of the economic scale than they are going up for the people at the higher end. And so as that becomes more but you would, uh, ingrained, but you can people see, get more you know, with You're it. not fighting the data. You can see that that 5% number is really low for you. I, I haven't seen the data. I haven't seen all the methodology behind it. I'm just saying that it's traditional that, that the polling on the economy trails the economic indicators. Okay. I hear we your, saw that I hear back your argument in the there. Let me, let me play yeah. something from this, uh, from this launch. Donald Trump talking about one of those promises, draining the swamp. Take a look. Many times I said we would drain the swamp, and that's exactly what we're doing right now. We're draining the swamp. I'd like to get specific with you on how do you prove that? Uh, because we'll show here, when it comes to the Trump lobbyist connection, and this is well documented, a lot of lobbyists, 182 who have worked basically in the Trump administration and as lobbyists, or a wider thing, if you talk about the, you know, the Washington swamp, take a look at the overall spending uh, in 2016, it was $2 billion, roughly. It's jumped up in the Trump era, over $3 billion. Um, so by that metric, it doesn't look like the swamp is very drained, right? Well, and I, th I would point to one of the first things the president did when he entered office was to issue an executive order that forbid people like me, who is a, who is a senior p uh, position in the White House, from leaving and going directly to become a lobbyist. So things like that to start that process. He's also cleaning out in terms of eliminating uh, a lot of bureaucratic positions that don't always necessarily need to be filled. So we're reducing the size of the federal government, reducing the regulatory burden. It's a long process. Process. The swamp has been ingrained for a very long time, and I think that's also what, one of the things that the president will fight to keep doing uh, in a second well, term. Well, I guess, I mean, that's part of the question, right? Is, does he have to fight it because there is still a swamp and it's getting worse from the numbers I show, like more spending, or, or is he fixing it? Which is the answer right now? Well, the lobbyist spending, that, that is something that goes on. You know, obviously that's made by corporate decisions and, and who they're hiring as lobbyists. What we can do, though, is try to reduce the influence of people going immediately from the administration into lobbying, cashing in that way, and also just reducing bureaucratic tape, uh, reducing the, the federal workforce, modernizing it, trying to eliminate uh, agencies and things that are duplicative, and really trying to reform government in a longer sense. Again, it can't be done overnight. In many cases, we need help from Congress to help in some of those well, areas. Yeah, but it's I mean, the that's why I put the, the numbers. That's making. why I'm pressing on the facts. 182 has nothing to do with Congress 
or corporate spending. It has to do with all of these lobbyists that are hired by Trump that are around Trump. Um, going through a couple of these issues in the time we have, I also want to talk uh, about the way the, the president looks at, at immigration. He's talked a lot about it in the most stark terms like an invasion. Take a look. This is an invasion. When you see these caravans starting out with 20,000 people, that's an invasion. We're talking about an invasion of our country with all types of criminals and gangs. People hate the word invasion, but that's what it is. It's an invasion of drugs and criminals and people. And in many cases, and in some cases, you have killers coming in. This is, as you know, a big, a big claim, sir. Uh, do you happen to know where the U.S. falls in terms of the countries that have the, the most refugee population? I don't know the stat off the top of my head, but I, I can tell you. Would you? That there well, was let me a story ask you this way. That, then. Would you? Would you say it's the U.S. is high? Like, are we top five? I, I wouldn't know overall, but I can tell you. Would the, you say? That, I the, just. The, and then the I'll, I'll let you. Is, I always let people go, so I'm gonna let you have your turn. But just because there's so much yeah. talk, it makes it sound like. It's so bad. Would you say we're top 10? Uh, again, I don't know the stats. All right, let me put it up for head, the viewers, and then I'll give you your turn, just because the facts matter. You look at who has the most refugees. We're not top five. We're not top 10. Uh, we're hundreds of thousands below 10th. Uh, and so I wonder at a certain point, do you think that Donald Trump has been hyping and exaggerating? Uh, the immigration numbers to scare people rather than dealing in the facts. You, you seem to mention you didn't, you admit you don't know that fact. Uh, I, I give you time to respond. Well, I think the first off is let, let's talk about what we're actually talking about here, not refugees. We're talking about a flood of illegal immigrants coming into our country. Right now, we are on pace to have a larger population illegally enter our country than Atlanta and Miami, Florida combined. That is over a million people. It would be the 10th largest city in the country if it continues the way it was going. And just today, I saw a stat out that said in just two of the caravans, one of them late last year, one of them a short time later, there were 1,500 people that were taken into custody that had U.S. criminal backgrounds, including for sexual assault, murder, well, look, assault with uh, I, deadly I mentioned weapons. the refugee part because it's important. Crime is bad. I think everyone can agree on that. But if, if you want to go broader and talk about all migration, we could do that. We have the receipts here. I'll put up on the screen the overall migration. Now, there are undocumented people trying to come into the country. But when you say it's really bad, we can look over the decades. This is overall border crossings since 1980. Uh, you don't need to be a statistician to look at this on the screen and see that the current recent era, both under this administration and the most recent one, is far lower than at recent times in American history. Uh, do you acknowledge that fact? And is it a problem that Donald Trump doesn't seem to get it? Well, no, I think what, what, you're, what you're doing is you're, you're, it's not the same situation now that it was in the 1980s. No, in sir, the 1980s, it's not. It's, 1990s. Lower migra it's much lower migration. Well, let's have, let's have an intellectually honest conversation let's. about this. Those numbers at that time were primarily, in most cases, three quarters or more, were single men from Mexico seeking to come here for economic reasons. The laws were written to address that fact. We, they, if someone comes across from Mexico, they can be immediately sent back across the border. What we have now is that two-thirds of the people who are coming across are not from Mexico. They're from Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, the Northern Triangle. But far and fewer people. They're family that, units, yes, and our and, laws and are that's not a, written that's a to That's a humanitarian crisis that a lot of people say has been compounded by family separations and other measures. But, sir, it's fewer people. I can put it back up on the screen. You, you said different population types, different family groupings. You do acknowledge it's fewer people, and the president seems to claim the opposite. Well, no, it, it, I think he's, he's talking about how our laws are not written and to deal with the current problem as it is. The overall numbers are one thing. The type of numbers are absolutely very important. Because right now, today, if someone comes across and counts in one of those numbers, they're from Mexico, we can send them right back. But we've got to talk about what the real problem is. There's something now going on called child recycling, where people are coming into this country with a child who's not their own, provided by a cartel, provided by drug Runners, so they can fake family Mark, ties, get in here, Mark, and then you, they ship you, the kid really, back Mark, to do it all again. You're, you're bringing up something else. Do you really expect people to believe that the Trump 2020 campaign is concerned about the welfare of those children when the explicit policy was to separate them from their parents? In other words, yes, you said let's have a good faith discussion, but the, the whole 
issue is the Trump administration has explicitly advocated policies to separate, isolate, and punish the child population. That, that, but that's, that's now, the, come on now, Ari, you know better than that. That policy started under the Obama administration. We actually are under court orders that we cannot hold a child longer than a, just a few weeks. I think it's 28 days if I go off memory. And in many cases, the adults can be held longer. Look, well, you can't separate I'm, them from I'm the gonna, child. I'm going to pick the, which things to focus on. If you, if you want everyone, and I want people to hear from you directly and respectfully, if you want everyone to believe that the Jeff Sessions zero tolerance policy was something you were forced to do by your predecessor, you know, you're going to have to carry that water by yourself. I got to ask you about one more thing, uh, and I don't mean to save the most obvious kind of toughest question for last, sir, uh, but Donald Trump assured everyone, including his base, that he says is, is going to be key. He promised them one thing about the wall. You know what it is. He promised them that somebody else would pay for it. Take a look. Believe me, Mexico's paying for the wall, okay? That's it. If I win, if I become president, Mexico will pay for the wall. And by the way, Mexico will pay for the wall. They will pay for the wall. That I can tell you. Mexico's going to pay for the wall. They don't know it yet. They don't know it yet. They're starting to have a very good idea, but that's okay. And Mexico's going to pay for the wall, and they'll be happy to do it. As president, Donald Trump has fought hard, shut down the government, and even used executive powers to seize funds to make Americans pay for the wall. Do you think that's sort of the toughest broken promise for the reelection campaign? No, absolutely not, because right now Mexico is doing more to secure our border than the United States Congress and led by Democrats in the House of Representatives. So but Mexico they're not paying is for actually the wall. starting. They are paying for it by sending 6,000 troops down to the border to protect their southern border to stop them the migration sending their of military people up to, north. Them sending their military places is not them paying for the wall. I guess this is the question, and I'll, I'll leave you with a final word, because I always try to give my guests time, and, and we're going over I appreciate on time. That. Uh, Donald Trump promised Americans, and particularly those MAGA supporters, you're not going to have to pay for the wall. He's making them pay for the wall. Is your closing argument on that? It's okay, it's a broken promise, he didn't fulfill everything, or is your closing argument on that a bold-faced lie claiming that Mexico is paying for the wall, which you know is false? Well, what I can tell you is the wall's being built. 400 miles of it will be done by next year. And when you look at the amount of money that Mexico is paying to keep asylum seekers on their side of the border rather than the U.S. border, they're providing them education, they're providing health care, they're sending their troops down to their southern border, protect, and they are patrolling their transit lines up to the north to try to stop these caravans. Mexico is paying a lot for our southern security. And that, I, not would, the wall. I would call it a virtual wall. That's your closing argument. They're paying for a virtual wall. I, I would say they're spending a lot of money to, to protect our southern border while Democrats continue to drop the ball and let Mexico do more than they're willing virtual. to do. Well, look, uh, as I mentioned, I mentioned to my viewers, we make time for people here. I granted you your time. I really appreciate coming on the beat. Mark Lauder from Trump 2020. I hope you come back. Hey, I'm Ari Melber from MSNBC. You can see more of our videos right here. Or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us. And we appreciate that.